Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today's video is gonna be on probiotics. Can they reduce inflammation in the gut? Excited, except really excited to dive in on today's topic and really look at some of the research on this as well. Before we do, please smash that like button, hit the bell so you get notifications of more live videos coming your way. Also, put your comments down below. Let me know your thoughts on the topic. I always love to hear your experiences. All right, so let's dive in. Probiotics, what are they? Probiotics are beneficial bacteria. So we have like dysbiotic bacteria. These are bad bugs. Things like Citrobacter, Proteus, Morganella, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas. These are bacteria when they're overgrown can cause significant problems. They can disrupt motility. Their overgrowth can also be known as SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or just dysbiosis if you want a more broader general term. And they can produce different gases, whether it's hydrogen or methane gases. These gases can disrupt motility. So with hydrogen gas, you may see more diarrhea. With methane gas, you may see more constipation. They can disrupt stomach acid secretions and enzyme secretions and enzyme activation. When you have enzyme and HCL or hydrochloric acid issues, you can also have bile salt and biliary function issues. So maybe a harder time breaking down fat as well. So we can have poor fat digestion. We can have poor motility. We can have poor nutrient absorption or nutrient extraction from our food. And then of course, when we have dysbiotic bacteria, you get a lot of these compounds known as lipopolysaccharides or LPS or endotoxin for short, kind of the same thing, but they're a toxic-like byproduct in the second ring of that bacteria shell. And they are actually toxic, very toxic on the liver. And so your body has to deal with that and process it via the liver and the lymphatic system. And that can definitely disrupt things in the body. And of course, 80% of your immune system is in your intestinal tract. You have some in the GALT, which is the gastric associated lymphoid tissue that's in your stomach. And you have the MALT, that's the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue that's more in the small intestine area. And so these bacteria obviously play a major role on your immune system because if you have the stressor that's really close by to your immune cells that can definitely activate your immune cells and can suck up energy and allocation of other resources. Because if your immune system is activated because of all those bacteria, that can cause a lot of stress and a lot of energy pulls. So you have less energy allocation for your hormones or for your mitochondrial or for absorption and digestion. People forget 30 to 40% of your energy that you get from protein goes into digesting protein. So sometimes food can take up a lot of energy in and of itself. And then of course, because a lot of these stressors can unzip the tight junctions in the intestinal tract, that can cause leaky gut or gastrointestinal permeability. And so when you open up these tight junctions, that can definitely stress out the immune system because now the immune system is actually starting to see different things, undigested food proteins, bacteria, LPS, uh, mycotoxins or fungus and yeast in the bloodstream where it normally wouldn't see them. And again, people forget, but like the inside of your stomach or inside of your intestinal tract is actually still considered outside of your body. So you swallow food, right? It's still considered outside of your body. When it absorbs into the bloodstream, now it's going inside. So technically outside and then going in. And so it's really important that as you start bringing things in, if you have gut permeability issues, then you're going to create more immune stress. So let's look at a couple of studies and kind of dive into what some of the literature says on this topic. Okay, let's hit this up. All right, cool. So first study here, I wanted to highlight a couple things. I want to look at the mechanisms, like big picture with the gut. We know there's a lot of immune cells in and around the intestinal tract. We know some of the negative things that dysbiotic bacteria causes. I talked about the motility. I talked about the increased risk for poor digestion, enzyme, acid, bile salt issue. I talked about um, affecting motility. I talked about absorption also activating the immune system. And then also when it comes to that, when you're overly activating the immune system, guess what can happen? You're at an increased risk for food allergens. So the foods that you're eating have a higher likelihood they're going to actually create food allergenicity and overactivate your immune system. The last thing you want your, do, you want your body dealing with is going after and attacking the food that you're eating. You want it to deal with the stress of your life. You want it to deal with performing well, having energy, sleeping and recovering, not going after your food. So this one study here in the Journal of Nutrients, Evidence of Anti-Inflammatory Effects of Probiotics and the Symbiotics of Intestinal Chronic Disease. This study looked at selected probiotics in vitro which is I think test tube, and it looked at their anti-inflammatory properties. So probiotic strains and cell-free supernatants reduce the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines. 
This is this is principally mediated to toll-like receptors. So toll-like receptors are essentially the interplay of different chemical communicators that interplay with the immune system, like interleukins and cytokines. They interplay with them. Probiotic administration improved the clinical symptoms. That means symptoms of inflammation, histological alterations. That means the tissue looked less inflamed and the mucus production in most of the evaluated animal studies. But some resulted, uh, results suggest that the caution should be taken when administering these agents uh, in the relapse of IBD. That's intestinal bowel disease. Uh, in addition, no effects on chronic enteropathies were reported. Probiotic supplementation appears to be potentially well tolerated and safe with patients with IBD. That's like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Yeah, and then, uh, indeed, probiotics such as bifido, bacter longum, improve the clinical symptoms in patients with both mild to moderate ulcerative colitis. Although it's been proposed that probiotics can improve benefits in certain conditions, the risk of benefits should be carefully assessed before initiating any therapy. So really interesting, right? Because you got to look at the mechanism here. What's happening? So I'm not a big fan of just throwing probiotics at people's guts because if they have a lot of inflammation, yes, you can reduce some inflammation. But what if the bacterial balance is really off in the gut and you have a lot of fermentable sensitivity? Probiotics are going to be fermentable, right? They're fermentable oligo. They're, they're essentially in that FODMAP kind of camp. And you could be probiotic intolerant. So my general recommendation is to weed out the gut, knock down some of the dysbiotic bacteria before we kind of come in there with probiotics. But yeah, I mean, so it's definitely showing a reduction in inflammation, which is pretty cool. Another study right here. I'll go this one first. So this one they're talking about here, the use of probiotics could improve the gut microbial population. We already know that because we're adding more good bacteria. So if we have high levels of bad bacteria, that's going to start to sway things back. Again, you're not going to move the needle a ton because you got six, seven, eight pounds of bacteria in the gut. But they're showing here, it's going to prevent the destruction of the tight junction proteins by decreasing the LPS. So what that means is we're taking our tight junctions, when we have leaky gut, we're unzipping those tight junctions, food, proteins, and bacteria, LPS can get through. So the dysbiotic bacteria, right, the outer coating of that dysbiotic bacteria is LPS. So if you look at LPS and dysbiotic bacteria, dysbiotic bacteria is gram-negative bacteria mostly. And these bacteria have like two cell walls. So you have the outer wall and then you have the inner wall. Imagine it's like a, a castle, and then you have a moat, and then you have the castle wall. So the moat is like the first cell wall, right? And the second cell, the second wall is the actual wall of the castle. So think of the lipopolysaccharides as that outer cell wall. Let's see if I can get this better. We'll do gram negative bacteria. All right, cool. So here you go, right here. So you have the first wall right here is your LPS. And then you have a second wall right here. First wall second wall. And so this is the, the more toxic type of component that we're seeing here. And this is what's driving. This is what's driving the gut permeability. And so right here, when the LPS binds to endothelial cells, to toll-like receptors, these are just kind of immuno, immunological compounds in the same family as interleukins and cytokines. It's activating your macrophages. It's activating inflammatory markers. So it's activating your immune system. It's getting the troops mobilized. Furthermore, decrease in dis gut dysbiosis and intestinal leakage after probiotic therapy may minimize the development of inflammatory biomarkers. So it seems like the major mechanism here, it's decreasing gut permeability, and that's also having a major effect on these different immune cells via these toll-like receptors, more than likely interplaying with cytokines and interleukins. It's also showing here that these inflammatory biomarkers blunt unnecessary activation of the immune system. In turn, probiotics improve the differentiation of T cells, Th2 and interleukin-4 and interleukin-10. And so you have two parts of the immune system. When the Th2 immune system becomes more dominant, that's the, the humoral antibody part of the immune system. That's going to stimulate more antibody production. So if you're stimulating antibodies to your thyroid or connective tissue, that's going to exacerbate autoimmune issues. So really important effects here that we see with probiotics modulating the Th2 part of the immune system. If we're modulating Th2, we tend to also modulate Th1 because they're kind of on a seesaw. And you can see interleukins, the present narrative, Review explores the interaction between the gut microflora, probiotics, and the immune system starting from general perspective. So really interesting here. Another interesting study I, I wanted to highlight here. Impact of probiotic administration on C-reactive protein concentration. So this is a, 
uh, systematic review, a meta-analysis, and it's looking at C-reactive protein, which is a protein made by the immune system in regards to inflammation. So this is interesting. The meta-analysis indicates a significant reduction in CRP. So that means these probiotics are reducing inflammation, which is very interesting. The findings were robust in a sensitive analysis. Meta-analysis suggests that probiotics administration may significantly reduce serum CRP while having no effect on serum interleukin-10, TNF-alpha. So it's, it's really having other effects on modulating the immune system. So pretty cool. Really, really interesting here out of the gates, guys. Just wanted to highlight that for you. Just kind of lay it all out. Hopefully it makes sense to you. I'm going to go a little bit deeper in a second. So in regards to this, let me kind of summarize. So probiotics play a major role. Right? They modulate the immune system. They affect these toll-like receptors, which has major effect modulating different interleukins and cytokines. It has effects modulating the Th2 part of the immune system. So Th2, Th1 are our are, are cytotoxic immune response. This is our natural killer cells, helper cells. And that's Th1. And then Th2 over here is going to be our humoral antibody immune response. And we start to have this Th2 dominance that can affect it. You can see Th2, Th1 dominant conditions too, but it seems like the probiotics play a major role in kind of modulating that Th2 response and, and, and also majorly affecting the gut permeability. The more gut permeability you seem to have, the more foods, the more bacteria, the more different mycotoxins or stressors from the gut can get into the bloodstream. And remember, it starts, we talked about activating macrophages as well. Macrophages are really important because the more you start to stimulate your immune cells, that sucks up energy, that sucks up resources. Didn't really talk about it here as well, but you have lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin that can also make its way towards the brain and it can cross that blood-brain barrier, which are essentially our astrocytes. It can get into that brain. It can activate a lot of these glial cells, which are white blood cells in the brain that are involved in cleaning up little Pac-Man, Pac-Woman of the brain, cleaning stuff up. And that can cause brain fog and more brain inflammation. So gut issues, right, can also impact the brain. That's why a lot of like the newer families of antidepressants that are coming out in the years to come, looking at the research to come, are going to be more working on an anti-inflammatory mechanism in the brain not necessarily blocking, you know, reuptake ports like SSRIs would. So really powerful, really important. So hope this makes sense. You guys just want to kind of connect the dots here. I don't think the solution is you just throw probiotics at people's guts that have problems. I know conventional medicine and allopathic medicine are going to look at that. They're going to find a way to patent these things to, to nuance them so they can prescribe them and, and have that whole allopathic model work. But you know, with when in natural medicine, functional medicine world, like we're making these diet changes, we're impacting the microbiome by improving digestion. We're, we're improving motility. We're addressing specific infections that could also be at play too. So there's a, lot, there's a lot more things happening at once than just throwing a probiotic at people. And also there are a lot of people that have SIBO and other gut issues that may feel worse with probiotics because they have lots of dysbiotic bacteria and throwing that probiotic in there sometimes can kind of chum the water, so to speak, and they can get kind of a feeding frenzy of negative histamine symptoms as well, brain fog, fatigue, issues like that as well. So really important. You got to work through kind of a systematic approach. In my model, we're really working on foundational things, diet, lifestyle, motility, digestion. We're really making sure everything is dialed in with hydration, movement, everything there. And then we kind of dial in the hormonal support and then the gut stuff comes down the road. In my 6R model that kind of overlaps, what we're working on removing the bad foods. First, we're replacing the enzymes and acids and we're really making sure we have good motility. Second, we're working on the hormones as well because Hormones play a major role with your immune system and your gut lining being able to heal. So if you're in this sympathetic state, your cortisol is overly high or overly low, it's going to be hard to get your immune system back on track. So we have to get your immune system back on track, circadian rhythm back on track. Then that's where the fourth hour plugs in. We work on removing the bugs, dysbiosis. Fifth hour, we work on repopulating the good bacteria. This is where the probiotics come into play. Also some prebiotic fibers as well, because they play a major role as like kind of fertilizer for those good bacteria. And then 6R, we kind of retest and make sure whatever our focus of addressing is actually addressed. So I hope that makes sense for you guys. If you want to dive in deep, if you have chronic gut issues, or you want to work on using probiotics kind of for your own benefit to improve your health, click down below. You can reach out to myself, Dr. J, and or my colleagues will be here to help you. And you can schedule worldwide to kind of get a hold of me. And if you enjoyed today's video, give me a thumbs up, comments down below, and feel free and share with family and friends. All right, let me hit a couple questions for you guys here too. How many CFU should I be taking? I mean, it depends. I mean, a good probiotic, like in my line, it's going to be about 40 billion per two capsules of my probioflora. So anywhere between 20 
and 100 billion is fine. I mean, good probiotics are going to put CFU count. They're going to put their CFUs of when, when they would expire, what would be expected to be in that bottle at expiration. That's important. So when you get my probiotic that says 20 or 40 billion a capsule per serving, that's going to be the estimate at expiration. A lot of the cheaper companies, they're going to tell you how much is there when they manufacture it in perfect condition. And then you may get this, you know, 30, 40, 50, 80% um, drop off after that. There's some consumer review reports talking about this. And so you really want someone that's going to be over producing the probiotic, kind of giving you the, the worst case scenario. And then you want to make sure they're stored well. So when we store ours, it's going to be in climate controlled, uh, uh, anti, should they dehumid or a, a humidity controlled environment, air conditioning, et cetera, just so that you maximize potency. And then there's different kinds of probiotics. There's three major kinds that I kind of put in, in kind of different lanes, right? The first one are going to be your bifidobacter and lactobacillus species. So a lot of that data was on like the bifidobacter longus, right? Your bifidobacter, lactobacillus, and there's different strains of that, whether it's plantaris, longum, bifidum, lactis, right? Infantis, there's different strains within that. And there's some that may be used for like H. pylori, like the L. rotary strain, or L. rotary can be used also for UTI stuff. And there's like the KCI strain, a lot of times can be pulled out if you want to do a lower histamine strain. So there's different blends of that. There's also your spore-based probiotics, which are going to be more in the bacillus family, bacillus coagulans, subtilis, clausii, lycanformis. And then you have your saccharomyces, which really is more of a, a beneficial yeast, but it has major effects on modulating IgA. It can crowd out a Clostridium difficile. It can help with H. pylori as well, improve IgA, improve gut permeability. So there's a lot of benefits of those three kind of lanes. Your Saccharomyces, my line, it's Saccharoflora. Your Bifidobactum, Lactobacillus, your broad species, those are your probioflora. And then your, like your Megaspore, your Bacillus type of species, that's going to be your spore-based probiotic. And then you have some ancillary in between, whether it's, whether it's a, um, a, a rudery strain or different lower histamine strains. So good questions on that. And then should you be taking probiotics every day? I think it depends on your diet. I think if you are eating good fermentable foods, you're getting some uh, Bubby's pickles or some sauerkraut or some kimchi, or you're getting a little bit of low sugar kombucha, you're getting some fermentable food in there, that's great. Then maybe go through a, a probiotic bottle once a quarter or something. I think it'd be good if you're already doing well. If you're really not eating any fermentable food at all, I think it'd be good to definitely keep probiotics in your diet more regularly, whether it's one or two capsules a day, just so that good, healthy, beneficial flora is going to help with a lot of these other things we talked about. Also, I didn't mention it in the video, but probiotics, when you have good, healthy bacteria, it's actually going to produce nutrients. It's going to synthesize vitamin K. It's going to synthesize different B vitamins, B12. It's going to help with different nutrient absorption. So very important on that front. So guys, excellent questions today, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Feel free and share with friends and family and put your comments below. And if you want more support, I'm available. Reach down below for the link. All right, guys, take care. Have a good one. Bye now.